As we begin, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord God, this is your time. And we come as your people. Come and speak to our hearts and change our lives, we pray. Amen. And let's continue as we sing, King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, living in me. God, we come here today to serve your majesty, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge your supremacy in our lives. As Peter said to Jesus, where else would we go once we have known you? And you are that rock in our lives. You are the foundation upon which everything is built. And without which, if we took it away, everything would fall apart. And so we do live to serve your majesty. But we thank you as well that we can call you friend. You may be our saviour, but you are our closest friend as well. And that you wrap us in your love, that love eternal, faithful and true that we sang, we sang about. That you don't, don't just want our minds, but you want our everything. And in that relationship of love, you bind us to yourself. And you bind us to each other as well. And so, Lord God, we pray that in this time together we may be drawn closer to you, closer to one another. Wipe away those things that stand between us and you. Forgive our sins as we acknowledge them before you. And help us to set aside anything that separates us from one another as well. That in your love all may be one. And Lord, we pray it in and through your holy name. Amen. Can't remember, believe this is my last time doing this. 
Um, years ago, when I was young, we used to call this prize giving for the young people, <laughs> which sounds um, a bit odd in a way when you think about it. <laughs> a prize for coming to church, and you got a bigger prize the more Sundays you came. Seems a bit unfair. Um, And this time I wanted to give you something that you'd remember us by, because you've been really special to us, and um, especially me, he's had a lot to do with the kids and the youth. So you're not having a book this time. You're having one of these. These have been my go-to for the last few months because this plush is called Hope and I've given them out to people to hold on to hope if they're having a bit of a difficult time. Because some of the time we'd feel nice and breezy and bouncy. It feels quite bouncy, doesn't it? But some of the time we feel squashed And as though we can hardly breathe. Totally overwhelmed. So I wanted you to remember to hold on to hope. Because I know that during your life you'll have some nice, like bouncy, fun times. But you will have, as part of life, some of those squashed, where it seems as though you can barely breathe times. But... If you know me well, I always ask God, how? How do you hold on to hope? How do you get it from your head down into your heart, inside of you, so you can almost physically hold it? That's the British Sign Language for how. So how can I get it there in my hands? So um, I remembered that a few years ago, somebody told me hope in the Bible isn't like we use hope where we sometimes use it a bit wishy-washy. We could have said when we looked at the forecast a few days ago, oh, it's going to rain, but I hope for Steve's last service it's sunny. But hope in the Bible is a promise that God's good things are going to come, even when you're squashed. And it's like you waiting for Christmas. You don't know what you're going to get. And you might have had a bit of a bad time, but there's going to be something good. That's what holding on to hope's like. So I wonder if you could put up the first slide. So I had to find it in the Bible to convince myself this was right. So it says, you will overflow with confident hope. That confidence that something good coming through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I thought, is that a clue how I hold on to hope? Is it actually the Holy Spirit, which is God and Jesus here on earth? We don't have to understand it. The Holy Spirit is with us. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but it's a bit like the wind, it says. We can feel it sometimes. So I wanted some other clues. So I stumbled, as I often do, onto these verses yesterday. These were actually on my Instagram account. What God determined as a way to bring out the best in us. So God always wants to bring the best out in us. What God has arranged for those who love him. But you've seen and heard it because God, by his spirit, brought it all out into the open before you. So how has that hope come out into the open, I thought? How do I see it? How do I hear it? Because I can't actually see him with these eyes. And very few people, a few do actually hear a very loud voice that's God, but very, very occasionally and very few people. How do we hear and how do we see? And I felt this little reminder inside me that said, um, you discovered in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is a reminder of things. discovered that years ago when I was teaching dyslexics, and especially for the Christian dyslexic, it was really comforting because dyslexics often have a problem remembering. So I used to pray that for my dyslexic kids, that they would remember what I taught them. The Holy Spirit would help them. So I thought, all right, you will remind me. So what else have I learned over the years? So what are you going to remind me about? 
So then I thought back to the Holy Spirit is the comforter, it says in the Bible. It brings you comfort. And I thought about this time when Tim was a baby, my oldest son, and my back had completely gone like it did a couple of years ago. And I couldn't move very well and I definitely couldn't look after him. And Steve had just started ministerial college, so we'd given up two good jobs. So we hadn't got any money to pay for babysitters or nannies or anything like that. And God told a friend of mine, who at the time was up north in somewhere like Leeds, told him to get in his car and instead of waiting to the weekend to come home, to come that day, I can't remember what day it was, but it was earlier than he should have been, to knock on my door and to see me. That brought me huge comfort. So sometimes the things you can see and hear, the comfort the Holy Spirit brings you is in people that they will knock on your door or give you a ring or give you a hug. So what else have I known about God and seen and heard? Hmm. I wonder what you would have thought of. I thought of, he's my helper. When my back went two years ago, I had been driving you into Buckingham, back and forth, back and forth, um, because of COVID times to the Royal Latin. I obviously couldn't do that flat on my back. Very few of Ewan's contemporaries learned to drive early because they got their their provisional licences late. There were not that many driving instructors. But one, one, his best friend at the Royal Latin had learned to drive because his dad had taught him, had a September birthday, so he'd done it before the queues. That one friend lived in Bicester. That one friend was my helper. That was God sending me help when I needed it. What else have I seen him do? It says the Holy Spirit gives us gifts, and it says somewhere else that our gifts make room for us. So I'm dressed in orange today. Orange often, it's a long story, but it reminds me that I'm not second best. It's the second colour in the rainbow. But the orange is no lesser than the red. That's part of the story. I'm not second best to my brother, who's a gifted musician, who earns a lot of money. I'm not second best to anybody. God thinks I'm pretty awesome. Even if I am not very dexterous, I'm not very strong physically, but I've got a mouth. (laughs) Um, So that gift, he's made room for me. You've been very gracious and made room for me. But they've also made room for you lot. This church, I think led by joy, is a great church for making room for the young people. For stepping aside slightly to begin with, and then perhaps stepping completely back. So in a bit, Ewan's going to play with Vanessa as a way for you to remember, not only that it's nice to have him play these very last time, but that in Connect especially, but also in here, Joy and Vanessa and Sue have sometimes stepped aside to give room for you lot to develop your gifts. Misty, who often sang with you, and he's now in Australia, I heard it this week, is having a song published on Spotify in the week. Wow. It's partly doing that because she sang and played with you in our Connect. Making room. So the Holy Spirit does lots of things, and it helps us to hold on to hope. Those things when he sent me people to comfort me or people to help me or people have made room for me, it's helped me hold on to hope. Now, most of you will get one of these, but if... If you don't want one of those, you can have an owl instead. Now, owls are all about wisdom. Wisdom. And the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom as well. 
How does he do that? Sometimes through television programmes, through songs. Somebody told me to watch a programme on a dementia choir once, years ago, about six years ago probably. There was one sentence in it where they said that in Methodist Homes for the Aged, they gave everybody individual music therapy. That was wisdom. Lots of you know what happened with my dad. My dad was in a psychiatric ward. I paid for him to have private music therapy. It made his life better. It made it much easier for me to visit him. She taught me to use a drum to visit him and all sorts of things like that. God-given wisdom. So I, the one thing I want you to remember today is the Holy Spirit helps you hold on to hope. And he gives you all sorts of things, including that wisdom. And I did say you weren't getting a book. Well, actually, I was fibbing a bit. Because there's another verse. He said, Then you see, every student well-trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who can put his hands on anything you need, old or new, exactly when you need it. Found that in COVID. <laughs> Difficult one again to get your hands around and think, God, show me that that's true. But I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, Joy showed me in this service that truth in a very simple way. She always had more books than she needed. So if anybody turned up as a surprise or we had visitors, instead of like the church where I grew up in, you've got a prize for your attendance and the more you attended, the bigger prize you got, they could feel just as included. So in my cupboard are some of my spares. So there's a bag of books down there. Now, some were bought in covid so you're allowed to disagree with them. Because when I opened one, I thought, hmm, there's some good stuff in this, but I don't know, <laughs> it's for the older girls. So if you disagree, you're allowed to disagree. Um, so Silver's going to come and help me, and um, Sam's going to come for Lily, and I think the rest of you are here. And she's going to have the bag of the plushies, and you can... Um, most of you will have to have hope, because I've got more of hope. You can choose one of those. And then if you, if you come to me, I've got a book for you as well. So, so still, you, you can, if everybody is under 18, so that's Thomas and Catherine, we'll come to you if you really don't want to stay. You're too shy for that. What about if Becky comes out first? <laughs> and I can see Beth. Would you bother me giving you a seat? Are you going to come up? Come on up there. And then Sam, you can come to the living. Do you want a different one for the time? Which would you prefer? That one. Yeah. That's why. And then you have. So I'm just going to pray for you now. I had a little kind of nudge before I came. I wondered what on earth to wear, as I said, and I put this dress on because it's orange and it goes from hot to cold and cold to hot because um, it's linen. And then I put a jacket on the top and I looked at myself and I thought, you look like you're going to watch Wolverhampton Wanderers, which was my local team when I was growing up. And I thought, God, are you saying something to me? <laughs> and then I walk in, and Jenny goes, Wolverhampton Wondrous. So I thought, I think that's a bit of a nudge, God. 
So I want to encourage you that, as I said, the Holy Spirit gives you gifts. You're like that football team. Some of you will be like Lionel Messi, is he, who came on as a sub? Lionel. Lionel Messi, who came on as a sub for the American team yesterday and scored this amazing goal in the last minute. And oh my goodness, he's front and centre. But if you're not front and centre, if you're one of the defenders who's running and running and running to stop those goals going in, you're still as valuable as Leon Messi. The world might put a bigger price on him, but God doesn't. So remember that as a church, you're like a football team. You've all gifted and you've all got those gifts will make room for you. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that you tell us that we can hold on to hope. And we don't always know how to do it. But in the Bible it tells us that the Holy Spirit will help us. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be really be our reminder so that we'll remember that you're our comforter, that you're our helper, that you equip us with gifts and those gifts make room for us, that you're our encourager, that you've got a special place for us on your team and we're just as special as anyone else. Lord, open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to see who you're sending and what you might be saying on a television programme or in a song or just a comment somebody makes that has no idea how significant they are. Help us, Lord, to hold on to hope so that we can give it away to others too. Amen. I almost forgot. Ewan and Vanessa are going to lead us in surely goodness, love and mercy, which kind of sums up that God's goodness follows us all the days of our life so we can hold on to that hope.
So maybe I could claim it for myself. Um, we're going to pot right a, a long-standing wrong uh, now, um, because February of last year, you may remember that uh, Dennis Nizio uh, retired as uh, minister. Well, I don't know if Dennis will ever retire, but certainly he retired as uh, as pastor of uh, the Elim Church, who uh, meet in uh, on, in here on the afternoons. And Mick and Heather, who are with us uh, today. Uh, took over as co-pastors of the church, and I said to them, because they're very nice people, I said to them, well, it'd be great if you could come one Sunday morning and introduce yourself to the congregation. And they said, we'd love to come. And uh, I said, I'll arrange it sometime. And then every now and then I kept remembering and then kept forgetting and kept remembering and kept uh, forgetting. And uh, recently a little voice, uh, well, actually it was quite a loud voice, uh, said to me, if you're going to do it... It's going to have to be this week. So Mick and Heather, come up. Some of you will have met them already and, uh, and know them, but uh, come and introduce yourselves. And nearly 18 months in, let us know how you're finding Vista. And the mic is all yours. <laughs> we'll share it. Well, yes, hello, it's lovely to see you. We have met some of you, and, um, and that's been great. And yes, I mean, we're as guilty as Steve, really, because we said, you know, because our service is in the afternoon, you know, we've got the morning free, we'll come along sometime, and, uh, and for the same reasons, you know, it's, the weeks go by and we haven't made it. So it's lovely to be here and, uh, and to see you all and to uh, so introduce to I'm Heather, this is Mick. Um, we moved to, uh, to Bista from Guernsey. We'd spent seven years ministering at church in Guernsey. Um, so Bista's a little bit different, but we love it. It's, um, we love, love being here, love being, getting to know the area. It's an area we don't really know or didn't really know very well, and we're still getting to know it. So, um, so we're, we're enjoying being here uh, in, in Bista. So if you've got any tips for any good places to go and visit, come and let us know. We're still finding our way around. Um, and it's great to be um, ministering in the church, uh, the Elim Church here. As it's been said many times now in the last sort of eighteen months or so, that you know it took two of us to replace Dennis, um, and he was, uh, he's still around. He's still part of the church, um, him and Anne. Um, but yeah, it's taken the two of us to come and, uh, and fill his shoes. Um, but we're enjoying being being here, being part of of the Bista and part of Bista Elim. And De- Dennis is also very fond of saying that it took two people to replace him, and it's going to take half a person to replace me. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that, Steve. I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if there's um, sort of stuff to add to that. I think just to perhaps give you a very, very sort of one-sentence potted history of different things that we've done, uh, just to give you a feel for, for us as, as individuals. Um, We've worked as missionaries uh, straight after we were married uh, 38 years ago. Uh, We worked as missionaries in Belgium, um, church planting for three years. Uh, After that, we came back to the UK and um, after a few years started our family. And I've worked in IT consulting and Heather's worked in uh, various different roles uh, in schools and also um, credit referencing. Anybody into credit (laughs) referencing? She she worked in that area as well. and um, we always thought we'd go back into mission work. And uh, in the, the sort of late 1990s, we went to Bible college. I did a theology degree. Um, Heather was there with our uh, two little ones who were sort of like four and five at the time. Um, and we were, we were in Gloucester. And we worshipped at the Elim Church in, in Gloucester at the time. And um, after that, we were called back into a missions role, but based in the UK. So we lived in Bradford. Uh, for 10 years working for uh, HCJB World Radio, uh, HCJB Global, uh, Reach Beyond. The the names changed over the years Uh, and we were working with them for for 10 years up in Bradford. Um, Heather working on publicity for the the mission agency and I was working on their IT IT systems uh, both in the UK and around different parts of the world. So those are some of the things that that we'd, we'd sort of done. Um, and then we were sort of called from that back in, to become Elim ministers. Uh, ended up back in Gloucester for a couple of years before, as Heather said, we went to Guernsey. So we've done a number of things. Uh, we've got a number of different skills. We've not been ministers as long as Steve. Um, but um, we are both ordained uh, within Elim. And um, in essence, Heather leads the church and I help. Um, 
because I actually... Hinder. I hinder, yeah. Because <laughs> I actually have another role. I work two days a week for Elim Training, um, and the Elim headquarters is based over in Malvern. I don't go every, every week. I go about once a month. Um, so two days a week of my time uh, is spent doing some Elim, uh, Elim training work, which involves coordinating a lot of different things um, for, for Elim. So um, we have a, sort of different roles, and, um, but we've worked together and have worked together a lot uh, over the years. So that gives you a bit of a sort of a potted history uh, of us. Anybody got any questions for us? I think that's always a good thing. Steve yeah. might have one, but you know, feel free. Ask us, ask us anything, and I'll answer if I want to. <laughs> Any burning question? You've, you've stopped, oh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you, you have until the final hymn to think of a question. <laughs> because I know if you put on the spot, it's very difficult, yeah, isn't yeah. it? So we'll, we'll, we'll leave it until just before the final hymn when I, I understand there might be some sort of unexpected surprise thing happening um, anyway. Um, but we'll save any questions till, till then. Um, and, and if you do think of something, do, do ask it, although we're limited to one question because we might be a bit time-limited by that. Time limited. I would say these are wonderful people, <laughs> and even if you don't think of a question, do chat to them uh, afterwards and pray for their ongoing ministry yeah. and pray, as I hope you do anyway, for you know, the work of Bister Elim Church uh, um, in the afternoons here. Yeah. You're being offered an owl if you would like one. I'd love, love an owl, yes. <laughs> well, here is a owl for oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's lovely, thank you. <laughs> we, we all need wisdom, don't we? We do, definitely. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. As I've looked back over the eight years, one thing I thought of was all the new songs we've learned. Well, I say all the new songs we've learned. I mean, a, a huge number, but there's been some significant ones, and uh, I had at one time thought that maybe I would choose five of those, um, those uh, hymns and, sort of, and have those as the hymns today. I haven't, I haven't done that, but one thing I did think uh, when I saw a hymn that, uh, that worked for the service today, despite it being a new one, I thought, I think I can get away with uh, having you learn a new song on my last Sunday here. It's very easy to pick up. So much so that what we're going to do is Sue and Vanessa are going to play and sing it through and, and join in as you feel comfortable. We'll sing through the verse, we'll sing through the chorus, and then we'll stand up to start from the beginning again. So you've got a verse and chorus to get the feel of it, and, uh, and then we'll stand to sing. I have a friend. <laughs>
come and read, bring us our reading. The reading is from Revelation, chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulphur, This is the second death. Thanks be to God for this reading. Thank you, Jenny. You might have thought, well, we've had four weeks with Revelation. Revelation was the Bible month book, wasn't it? How comes we're back on Revelation again? Well, I have to say that when it's your last service, you can be a little bit indulgent and um, I realized that in terms of preaching across the, uh, the circuit uh, through the various weeks of Bible Month, I'd preached on uh, the first week, I'd preached on the second week, I'd preached on the third week, but nowhere was I scheduled to preach on the fourth week, which is the end part, which, let's face it, is the end of the struggle. It's the nice bits at the end, isn't it? And if you've worked your way all the way through the rest of it, it seems a bit of a shame if you don't get a chance to, uh, to at least cover the last bits uh, a little bit. So that's what I'm doing today, very uh, briefly, looking at these verses from the beginning of Revelation, chapter 21, about how life will be a new heaven and a new earth, or we could just sweep it into one phrase of, of just calling it, uh, it heaven. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do before leaving was to go to Tring's Natural History Museum and um, have a look at the dodo there. Has anyone seen the dodo in uh, Tring's Natural History Museum? Um, Did you know it's not a dodo? (laughs) I say I wanted to until I saw David Attenborough standing by said dodo and saying, nowhere in the world is there a stuffed dodo. And he went on to say, this one in Tring, which I still actually probably still like to go and see, someone created it from furs and skins from different animals (laughs) based on Seaman's reports of what uh, a dodo uh, looked like. And I I feel a bit for John as he's writing in Revelation. He's he's told to write down these these words are trustworthy and, uh, and true. And he's describing something that... Yes, he's seen, but he doesn't really have the words to articulate. And so you'll notice it's not like a sort of uh, a traveler's guide, isn't it? He doesn't say, and I saw there the uh, the gates of heaven, and they were in, you know, the uh, Rococo uh, style, and uh, make sure as you go through the, uh, the gate that you turn left and take in this wonderful... It's not like that at all, is it? Because it can't be like that. 
He's trying to describe something that we don't have the earthly words or understanding for. And so that's why there's a lot of symbolism is in their numbers and expressions that, that point us towards things like you know, supreme power or love or purity, all, all those kind of uh, symbolic uh, things. But I was interested as I read these verses that actually he's describing heaven in terms of relationship, in terms of friendship and the relationships that we have, which shouldn't come as a great surprise because if heaven is the best thing that we can imagine, one of the best things that we experience here on earth, if I said to you, look, at, look back through your memories and tell me the best things. Now you might, first of all, come back and say and talk about a wonderful holiday that you've had or a place that you enjoyed living or maybe even more specific than that, a home that you felt really at home in or, or maybe a car that you uh, owned or maybe it was West Ham, you know, winning a cup final or uh, something, uh, something like that. But if I said to you, would you trade that for a significant relationship that you've had? You know, a good relationship with a partner or... Uh, or with a child, or with a parent, or with with good friends, or maybe even with a pet. Would any of us do that? I suspect we probably wouldn't. Because actually relationships, when they're good relationships, are the best things that happen to us in uh, in this world. And, of course, we already know that relationships transcend time and space, don't we? Time and physical uh, location. If you're a tight-knit family and you move, does that really affect anything? You've moved from one town to another, maybe one part of the uh, country to another, maybe even moved across the globe. But does that change the relationships? Waits for answer, gets none. The answer is probably not. I was hoping for a no. Um, Or... Probably like me, you've got old friends that you may not have contacted for years and you give them a ring and you know, they're, they're in a different physical uh, place to where they were, a different phase of life, and yet you just connect and almost start from where you left off before. Relationships endure time and place. And so, if you want to put the, uh, the slide up, uh, Andy... And so the, the way that uh, John describes heaven is in terms of the three greatest types of earthly relationship that we can know here on this earth. Relationships with, uh, with good friends and with, uh, with our family, assuming that we have good relationships with our, uh, our families. The parent-child relationship and the marriage relationship. Family and friends, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And if you remember me preaching on the first uh, chapter of John's Gospel uh, a few months back, I, I said there, and it's exactly the same here, that when it talks about God coming to dwell, or in the case of John chapter 1, the Word, Jesus, coming and, uh, and living among us. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The, it's literally the, the, the same phrase as pitching a tent. So in Jesus' day, it would be someone who just appears you know, amongst uh, his own people and pitches a tent uh, with them. Karen was sharing about when she was young and relatives from Australia just coming and pitching up on, uh, arriving with their motor home and asking if they could pitch it on the driveway. Maybe that's the modern equivalent. The word became flesh and um, parked his motor home uh, among us. But it's about coming to your own people. The relationship that God has with us is one of friends and uh, and family. Kith Kith and kin, we say, don't we? And uh, when, when that struck me a couple of days ago, I was referring, I thought, I know what kin means. We kind of know what kin means, doesn't it? Our own kin's uh, folk, our family. But what the heck does kith mean? Anyone know? Actually, it's, it's a wider sense. Um, so it, it really means something like country and kinsfolk. So it's, first of all, those people that you are closest to, your immediate uh, family, those that you're related to, 
But then in a wider sense, those people that you consider your people, whether it's a tribe or a, a sort of nation or, um, or, a, or a country, but it's all those people that you feel a connection to, those people who are your people. And so it says here that God will make his dwelling place among his kith and kin, among his people. Um, God's dwelling place now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That friends and family relationship. And then there's the parent-child relationship. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's what we try and do for our kids, isn't it? You know, if they've fallen and they've hurt their knee, they come to you, you wrap your arms around them until they stop uh, crying. You tell them that things will be all right, even sometimes when in your heart of hearts you're not sure whether they will be all right, but that's your function as a, uh, as a parent. And as I've said many times before, the trouble is they get older and they get taller and taller and you still want to do the same for them and it's a bit harder when they're uh, fully grown and left home. But it's that parent-child relationship. He will wipe every tear from your eye. And then there's the marriage relationship. Who doesn't love a good, uh, a good wedding? I've, uh, I've done plenty of weddings and uh, it's amazing the number of people who stop and watch the bride, if they see the bridal car arriving and the bride getting out and coming to the, uh, the door. And then, of course, those of us inside the church, there's that buzz of anticipation as we're, we're asked to stand and the bride comes down the, uh, the aisle. And a reminder, if anyone is uh, feeling a bit devoid of weddings at the moment, we do have one here at uh, 3 o'clock next uh, Friday as Tony, gets, uh, Tony Leach gets uh, married. And uh, you're very welcome to, uh, to come to that. But it's the picture that we have here. The bride beautifully prepared for her, uh, her groom coming down from, uh, from heaven. And what better wedding can you get than uh, when you're marrying God? We can only begin to imagine what beautifully prepared looks like in that, uh, in that sense. But as John describes what heaven is going to look like, it's an amalgam of those three relationships. The relationship with family and with good friends, with with parents or children, with with a uh, a partner that leads to uh, to marriage. And he also just... So if it's about relationship, and within a relationship, we we can prosper, can't we? We can flourish, we can be... Ourselves, We know what it is to receive unconditional love. We, bec- we can become the people we were always meant to be. Particularly as John Potts it, there are no threats to that relationship. The old heaven and earth, with all of their imperfections and temptations, have passed away. The sea is gone. Now, some of you, including my wife, may not like that very much. Karen is looking forward to moving, not looking forward to leaving, but looking forward to arriving because she's always dreamt of being close to the sea in, uh, in ministry. And so far, the church has put us about as far from the, church, uh, the sea as you can get um, in our appointments. So we're actually going, and we'll be about 25 half, minutes, half an hour from the, uh, the sea. And in fact, my, my working patch sort of stretches out towards the, uh, the sea. John, John did not have a thing about the sea in terms of, you know, not liking the look of it. But the sea in those days, and you can imagine, you know, when you've got a, a far more primitive uh, form of, uh, of sailing, was a place of threat. You know, monsters were supposed to live in it. It was a place of, of chaos and, uh, and danger. And so it's in that sense that John's saying, you know, the sea, danger, chaos, what have you, threat is, uh, is gone. There'll be no more tears, death, mourning, crying, or pain. And then a whole host of people whose behavior marks them out as being opposed to true and pure relationships. Murderers, the sexually immoral and faithless. Those who practice magic arts to manipulate people and, uh, and things, and so on. No place for them in a place of relationship. 
So other than filling us with hope for the future, what does that say to us as Bister Methodist Church today? Well, first of all, if that's what God's future looks like, then that's what we should be aiming at now. You know, if, you, if you're fairly sure that heaven's going to look a particular way and that's God's way, then it's, that's the kind of look you should be aiming for now, even if it's a, a, a pale shadow. Now, if I, I'm not going to, but if I was to sort of throw out balls of string to you and get you to, uh, to hold on to uh, one end of the bit of string and to throw the ball across so that someone else uh, either catches it or, or picks it up uh, from the floor close by them, and they hold on to the string where that is and, th- and throws it again. You can imagine after about five, ten minutes of that, we've got a veritable cat's cradle, for those of you who remember playing cat's, uh, cat's cradle, of strings sort of crisscrossing all over the place, won't we? Now imagine that those are the relationships between you. I want to suggest that in terms of church, those and our relationships upwards to uh, God are pretty much all that matters. The building doesn't matter. The building's wonderful, but actually take it away, and it's a bit like a family moving. Take it away and put another building up, and church will be just the same. Our relationships will be just the same. So those are the things, don't get me wrong, I don't want in 10 years' time for you to say, well, the church had to close because we, we took you at your word and never spent another, another penny on maintaining the building. Yes, buildings have to be maintained. But it's much better to work on those relationships. And just imagine the bits of string that are now sort of going out from you to other people. Which of those represent the stronger relationships? Who do you feel well connected to here? Where are the relationships maybe a bit weaker? Or who are the people that you don't actually have a bit of string going to at the moment because you haven't had a chance to build a relationship yet? So Karen said earlier on about the the how, always ask the how question. Resolve now that you will do something. It might be just coming back for lunch. Maybe you never anticipated doing that. Maybe uh, you never anticipated after the question was asked earlier on. But maybe coming back for lunch would be a good thing to actually build, you know, one or two relationships with people that you haven't met before. All of you, not all of you, but most of you are in a very similar position. None of you will have perfect uh, bits of string going here, there, and everywhere. So don't be embarrassed to go up to someone and say, I don't know you very well. Why don't you come around for a cup of coffee? Or why don't we arrange to meet in Coffee One or the cafe on, uh, on Friday and, uh, and just get to, want to know, get to know one another a bit better because Steve said that would be a good thing for us to do. No embarrassment. This is, this, this is, this is one of those weeks where you're off the hook with uh, embarrassments uh, about maybe not knowing other people as well as you think you, uh, you ought to. Resolve, not just now, but always, that when relationships are strained with someone else, be the first person to take a step forward and try and do something about it. Learn to practice forgiveness. Keep building those relationships. And actually, when we do that, mission becomes easy. It's it's amazing how you talk about mission and evangelism and everyone sort of ducks their head down a bit. But actually... If our relationships are good and getting stronger by the day, then they naturally overflow to other people uh, outside. And when I talk about relationships, I'm not, I, I repeat, I'm not just talking about those bits of strings going across, but I'm talking about bits of string going upwards uh, as well. But it's natural that other people fall into those relationships in order that they might come to know God as well and become the people that they were created to be in hopefully an atmosphere of unconditional love. And people look at us and are attracted. Because if relationships are the best things and you see a place where people genuinely love one another, 
and I can't remember where it was, but, um, but there is a line, isn't there, somewhere that says, see how they love one another. I'm not going to try and think where that is now, but wouldn't it be a wonderful thing for people to say about Bister Methodist Church as they, as they look at us? See how they love one another. So I'm going to stop now, fairly abruptly, but just let our final hymn be my final words on the subject. As we sing, let love be real. be seated and let us pray Lord Jesus we thank you that we can call you our friend and we thank you that that relationship that we see in heaven that mix of all the best in our earthly relationships the marriage relationship the parent relationship the the friends and family relationship. We thank you that we can enjoy that relationship with you here and now. 
and not just something that waits for the future. And if we need any evidence of that and of your love for us, your unconditional love given to us, we have it in the bread and wine set before us today. And that memory, that on that last Thursday of your life, as you celebrated the Passover meal with your disciples, you took bread during that meal. You gave thanks and you broke it for them saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And we thank you that after supper you took the cup of wine, blessed it and gave it to them and said, this is my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so today, in memory of your love expressed for us then, in gratitude for the love that we find in you today, and in hope for that wonderful picture of love embracing all with the new heaven and the new earth, we do this in memory of you. And Lord, in the stillness, we bring others into the embrace of your love. We bring to you prayers for people and situations. Because you love them and you died for them as well. And that in your death and resurrection, we see that nothing is impossible for God your Father and that all things can be transformed in you. And so in this stillness, we bring our prayers before you. This is the body of Christ, broken for us, and his blood that was shed for us. As we feed upon him, as we take this bread and wine, as we remember all that it means, so let us leave the prayers that we have offered in his hands and trust them to his love and his power. Amen. If you've not um, had communion with us before, the bread and wine will come to you. If for any reason you don't wish to receive, then just keep your hands down like that, and whoever is giving the bread or giving the wine will know to, uh, to pass on that past you. Um, you can, you're very welcome to uh, eat the bread or the wine uh, as they come to you, but uh, if you want to, to keep it and, uh, and eat it with other people, once all the bread and wine have, uh, have been distributed, then I will first of all take a piece of bread and I will say something like the body of Christ broken for us. And if you still have your bread, we will sh- all share together and we'll do the same for the wine. And I would invite those who are distributing to come forward.
body of Christ broken for us. blood that was shed for us. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all people. Amen. Now, I understand that Val might want to have something to say. Now I understand that Val needs an intro ready for something to say. Karen, you might want to come up, I feel. Well, that's coming up. I did forget to say earlier on, uh, welcome to anyone watching this uh, on the internet or in that years to come. Thank you. Yes. I can't say keep it short, no, can I? To, yeah, no, you just you keep it up. No, you have to be holding oh. two hands. David showed me how to hold it. Um, <laughs> I'm stuck like this was, for the whole of the shared lunch now, aren't I? Absolutely. I was looking for somebody eloquent to do this, but everybody was suddenly busy... So you got me, I'm sorry about that. We made a bit of a collection around the church over the last few weeks, and some of that will be used as part of a circuit collection, which reminds me of something I forgot to mention earlier, was there's a circuit service for Steve next week at six, and refreshments at five, sorry. Um, so we wanted to buy something that would remind you of your time here in Bithsta, hopefully good, not bad. Um, you, it's not all been plain sailing, we've had some rough background with the COVID and things like that, but you led us through the whole thing with a smile, and the work you did with the children, Karen, was fabulous and much appreciated by us all. So basically, we want, hope you'll think back to your time in Bister with kindness, fondness, not horror. <laughs> so this is just a little something. So I know I've got to hold it like this. Am I allowed to open it so people can yes, see what's please. inside? That's, that's why I didn't give it to you at lunch, in case everyone wasn't here at lunch. Um, this is... I've very, no idea how very well sealed. Elaine wrapped it. Apparently she's good at this. I didn't. I'll leave you to it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So did you say that David had had a hand in this? <laughs> did you say that David had had a hand in this? So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it in the foyer as we, uh, as we close so, and then bring it through so that you'll have a chance to look at it at closer quarters. I'll have a chance to look at it as well. But thank you all. And thank you, David. I think we're ready for our final hymn. And if not, I'll be getting deputations coming through from the kitchen at the back. So let's sing, love divine or loves excelling, and in terms of what we've been talking about today, about Jesus being our friend, that friend that leads into an eternal friendship and relationship and the love that uh, embraces us. Look at how this starts in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, love coming down into our lives and living in us today. But that being a shadow, if you like, of what you get to in the final verse of that love that we will enjoy for eternity. Love divine, all loves excelling.
something a little bit uh, different. Um, as we didn't have the Lord's Prayer during the service, let's, instead of the grace, say the Lord's Prayer to one another. I'm sure you all know it off by, uh, off by heart. And we pray that God's will may be done in us here on earth, as is going on in heaven, and one day we shall look forward to in heaven. And we pray that as we look and remember the relationships around us, we pray that our sins may be forgiven as we forgive the sins of others. So let's say the Lord's Prayer to God, but shared by one another. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.